thank you very much. It's a real honor to be here. Um, I'm not so sure. I'm just really thrilled about going first here because what I'm going to show you is probably a lot different than what you're going to see from a lot of other people today. Um, Hard Energy, just real briefly, Hard Energy started out as a magazine publishing company in the energy industry, and we still have those, but uh, about 20 years ago, the company founded a downstream consulting group. Um, more recently, uh, the company started putting on large conferences on unconventional gas primarily. Uh, you may have heard of those. You might find those interesting if you ever have a chance to attend one because you'll hear the industry view of all this stuff. Um, more recently, we formed this upstream research and consultant group that I'm part of. And we're focusing entirely on, right at the moment, on unconventional resources. So what I'm going to show you today is just uh, kind of what we've found by digging into some of this stuff. Um, I just wanted to just tell you what I'm going to be telling you about. So I have kind of a crude, by that I mean brief outline of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to talk about heavy crude oil first. Um, both the so-called conventional and then the unconventional heavy crude oil. I'm going to talk about our forecast of shale and tide oil in North America, a little bit on what we see as the cost in the economics, and then some conclusions. On heavy crude oil, uh, the, the resources are really huge, and now it's, they're only beginning to start to be developed. Now, this, this uh, map shows uh, what we call conventional heavy crude oil, which is 10 degrees API gravity to 22 degrees API gravity. These are resource numbers. They're not reserves. They're just oil in the ground. These came from the, partly from the USGS and partly from some updates that we did just based on some new, new discoveries that are out there. The, the below 10 degree stuff is bitumen. Um, in some places, it's actually mobile in the reservoir. It's called extra heavy oil. That's found mainly in Venezuela. The Americas has by far the largest resources of this bitumen, this very heavy below 10 degree API gravity stuff. Uh, it also has significant conventional heavy oil. And in fact, in California, this heavy oil has been produced there for about 100 years. So this is not something really new. Um, if you look in the rest of the world, there's some in Europe, some in Africa that's mainly undeveloped, that's starting to be developed. The Middle East has huge heavy oil resources that are almost entirely undeveloped right now. And these are the conventional heavy oil, not the bitumen stuff. Uh, China, uh, this uh, Asia is mainly China. There's some in Indonesia. And then uh, Russian Central Asia also has these resources. This is our outlook for it. This is, uh, this is heavy crude oil. This is a field level forecast globally of heavy crude oil by region. And, and so it's a very bottom up forecast of what's out there. And uh, you can see the growth. We've got North America growing. Of course, this is, um, this is entirely due to Canadian oil sands oil. Uh, this, is both un this is both the real heavy stuff and the conventional heavy oil, so it's all lumped together. It includes the diluents and stuff that are necessary to blend with the Canadian oil to get it to market. So you've got North America growing because of Canada, South America growing because of Venezuela, primarily. You've got Europe, Russia, and CIS, I've lumped them together, they're very small and there's really no growth there. Africa, a little bit of growth, um, Asia Pacific, pretty flat, and then the Middle East grows because of the development of these large, unde un they're, they're known resources, they've just never drilled them. Uh, they're planning to do it, uh, apparently. Whether they'll get there or not is another story, because a lot of this is actually in Iran. Um, and this just lists some of the projects that are in there and the incremental capacities. These are not the incremental production because they all come on at different times. They decline at different rates. But these are the projects. The, the, it's not the entire list, but it's the main projects that are in that forecast. And uh, I've just shown the incremental capacity of 2020. And then further out in time, obviously, the, the, the later in time you go, the cloudier the crystal ball becomes. So I. I but there's still some out there that we think is, is realistic. It, whether it will be done or not is a different story. But you can see it's all over the world. The, these resources exist everywhere. They're not just, it's not just Canadian oil sands, for example. It's not just Venezuela. Um, 
So having talked about heavy crude oil, let's talk about shale and tide oil. Uh, we also do uh, play level forecasts of the uh, of Titan shale oil production in the United States and Canada. And this just shows it by play. Um, and you can see the, um, the Bakken, uh, uh, Bob Hurst mentioned the Bakken. We have a Bakken forecast down there. Uh, we have Eagle Ford, those are the big ones. Um, there's also the Permian is also a very large, fairly new kind of shale and tide oil play that's just getting started there. Um, and we see it gets up to about four and a half million barrels a day, which is quite a lot. Uh, and by 2030, this produces about 28 billion barrels of crude oil. And like I say, it's just the United States and Canada. Um, I have absolutely no quarrel with the decline curves that people use. In fact, I think mostly the industry uses very optimistic decline curves. This is a, we've looked at a lot of uh, shale well decline curves, and they, they typically follow uh, this power law relationship. Here's a well in the Bakken. You can see the incredibly steep initial decline from that well. And I, I just listed the parameters in the power law curve, so if anybody wants to look at it later and do the math yourselves, you can. Um, I'm going to diverge a little bit and talk about the Barnett Shale, which is actually gas, and there's a gas session after this. but but I just wanted to show this because even though you have these really steep power law decline curves, if you drill enough wells, you can get a pretty good production rate. And this is actually, that yellow line is the actual production from the Barnett Shale. The, uh, the blue squares are uh, the calculated production using 12 type curves. They're all power law decline curves and distributing, uh, you know, assigning each of the 15,000 wells that are in that play to a particular type curve and just adding it all up. And I can do a pretty good job that way of matching the actual production from this play. And I just decided to extend it on out a little bit. I slowed down the drilling and you can see it starts to decline pretty quickly. Um, but even by 2020 with a, you know, fairly pessimistic look at the future drilling, uh, it's still making 4 million cubic feet a day. So the fact that they decline real quickly does not necessarily mean you can't produce a lot of oil or gas from these things. It, it, you may not make a lot of money off of it. That's a different story. Um, in the Bakken, we see other kinds of decline curves. We see these harmonic decline curves in some of the wells, and these are mainly uh, up in the, in the, the <laughs> immature portions of the play where the oil is a little bit higher gravity. They tend to be rather low rate wells too, but at least they don't decline using a power law type relationship. Um, this is what the industry uses primarily, a uh, hyperbolic decline curve. I think these are pretty optimistic for any kind of a shale play. Um, this is some economics that we ran on some wells and just looking at, the, these are just individual wells. It doesn't include lease costs or anything else, but. Uh, but there are actual wells uh, that were drilled in the field by a number of different operators for different capital costs. The capital cost is listed there. Uh, the average uh, oil rate during the first year is listed there. There's one that's really good. The average gas oil ratio, the calculated uh, ultimate recovery, EUR means estimated ultimate recovery. Um, and then the rates of return. And you can see they vary quite a lot from 4%, which isn't very good, um, all the way up to, I don't, there's a typo on that one. It's not 87%. I think I pulled an old graph. But they, they get up to about 20%. So they're not impossibly bad. Um, these are some uh, break-even economics that we've calculated also. Again, they're well, well, they're individual well economics. but. Um, they, they tend to hover between 40 and a little over $50 a barrel. There's one there that's very high, it's $72 a barrel. That's not very good. And these kinds of wells, um, there are probably a number of these wells, so not all the wells are even economic. But on a play level basis, they, they must be, or companies wouldn't continue <coughs> to draw them. Um, just looking at some cost comparisons of different sources of crude oil, uh, these are just initial investment costs divided by the initial reserves developed by that investment in millions of barrels, and then the dollars per barrel is just dividing the two numbers. Um, so 
Uh, you can see that uh, the heavy, the real heavy oil sands type stuff is it's fairly costly, you know, uh, nine to seventeen dollars a barrel just to just to drill the wells and get the facilities and everything going to produce it. So it's fairly costly. It doesn't include operating costs. Uh, there's one that's real high cost in the Congo. It's because it's remote. Um, you look at the more conventional heavy oil, which are the lighter colors, um, you still see some very high costs, except in the Middle East, and you still have a lot of fairly, what I call cheap oil, left in the Middle East. Um, the bottom ones are light oil, the Brazil pre-salt, the Bakken shale oil well, and Permian shale oil well are all roughly the same. So th it's out there, it's just not cheap, other than in the Middle East. Um, I was going to talk about the rest of the world because there's these shale resources exist everywhere, but I'm not going to go through this. You can see it later, but there's just been an awful lot of uh, foreign companies investing in North America primarily just to acquire the technical expertise. So one would expect that this will eventually spread to other parts of the world. But this is the one I want to show you. This is the one that might get the, get the, uh, raise some eyebrows. This is a global crude supply forecast. This is supply by type of crude, okay? That great big blue wedge down there is light and medium crude. This is not my forecast, so I cannot swear by this particular forecast. The rest of this stuff, are these are our forecasts, and they're fairly <coughs> rigorously done, so I don't feel like there's anything weird about them. The, the light and medium crude is fairly flat, but it's not really, it's kind of at a plateau level out to 2030. Uh, and then you've piled on top of it the uh, various types of heavy crude oil, North American shale oil, um, condensate and NGLs, and yes, this is a volume, it's not energy units, but that, that EIA demand curve in the yellow squares there is actually in volume terms as well. And yes, NGLs have a lower energy content, and they're mainly used for petrochemicals. But what this shows, instead of a shortage coming in the near term, it might be a slight oversupply. And there, were no, there was no attempt here to reduce OPEC production for quotas or anything else. It's just a supply, and it's a scenario. And you know, a few years ago, I never would have showed uh, uh, supply curve like that. So I just like to quote Yogi Berra, the future ain't what it used to be. Uh, I think that's going to be, we're going to continue to be surprised by things, uh, by technology, by, by uh, new things happening in the world of these unconventional resources. Um, this just lists kind of numbers. I, I don't really like to go through word slides that much, but, um, but what we see, what, what, what I see right now is not any impending shortage of crude oil, and in fact, it could be the opposite. Um, there are, of course, always possibilities for interruptions and that sort of thing. So, with that, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>